I'm Mike Furick, I'm the founder and CEO of Allison. So um, I've been asked to talk about MOOCs and uh, new, new ways of learning. So I'm going to do something I haven't done in a while, and that's just not use a PowerPoint and just talk to you. So I've just 18 minutes. So, so let's get back, get right to it. Uh, in talking to a few of you over the last couple of days, some of you don't know what a, what a MOOC is, and that's fine. But what it is sounds something sophisticated. It's it's very simple. It's massive open online courses. So it's essentially, it's a website that has lots of courses in it, and sometimes you can download them. But the the one thing that you can definitely do is you can look at them for free. So the history of this is is it's, it's fairly recent, but there's some pioneers. The Open University has been doing this for quite some time. Then, in, um, certainly with the advent of YouTube, MIT put a lot of courses online. But it really took breath when, in about two years ago, a Stanford professor put a, a course on artificial uh, intelligence. And 150,000 people started studying the course and everyone. That really turned people's uh, attention and said, this is pretty cool. Then. A lot of the other universities says, oh, we need to be in this too. We don't know the economic model, but if he's doing it, I need to be doing it as well. So then it starts getting traction. And then a couple of players started, and mostly out of Stanford, probably the leading one, certainly on media, is a company called Casera that takes a lot of university stuff from Stanford and uh, other leading colleges and puts it up uh, so that you can study for free, mostly third level. And then you have people like Udacity, which is another Stanford. If then Harvard says, well, we don't know where the business model is, but we have lots of money, so we can really experiment here. Probably the only one that really can experiment. So we've started EDX. And then you have people on the other spectrum, like guys like uh, Sal Khan, who sees the market for, secondary, for high school, for, for math, and starts putting up courses for his nieces and nephews, and suddenly they get popular, and suddenly there's several million people on there looking. So it has become a very, very hot topic, and everyone says, yes, learning can be free online. And of course, the one thing that's underwriting all of this is that digi once digital content is on the web, the cost of sharing it is next to zero. And that's exciting, because that has a lot of opportunity. My own uh, journey here was around 2005, I realized that there was a lot of economics changing on the web. That essentially the cost of broadband was going down, the, the cost of servers was going down, and at the same time the cost of creating e-learning was going down, but at the same time that your ability to monetize any page on the web was going up. So I just saw a flip at some stage, where there, it was going to be possible to provide a page of free learning online profitably. So this is amazing because it can, number one, what an interesting business, because education worldwide is a three trillion dollar business, second biggest in the world. The second thing is, wow, what a social impact. Can you imagine if you could make ed all education free? So that set me on my journey. I owned a company that had IT literacy. I had six courses, I put them online. Make a, sh a long story short, we started with those six courses. We're now with 500 courses at certificate and diploma level. We have two million people online. We have over 300,000 graduates on Allison, and we're signing up nearly 200,000 people a month. So we're part of this tidal wave of free learning. Our space, though, is in the workplace allowing people to touch type, to learn English, to learn project management, essentially helping people to get a job. But the debate about MOOCs is raging. People see, oh, this is cool, it's free. You can listen to some of the top professors in the world and you don't have to pay Harvard admission fees. That's pretty cool. You can study on every subject. So that's pretty cool as well. Some of the issues that are coming up though is accreditation. So what if I, if I study on these courses? Who's gonna recognize it? Is that absolutely important? Isn't it important that you're learning? Of course it is, but a lot of people talking about accreditation. The other thing is structure. Sometimes these colleges give courses and they'll give, if you have 101, 102, 103 to 106, they might put up 105, but that's not much good to you if you, do, if you want to really do 101 and 102. So the structure, there's not that great structure on it. But the biggest debate of all is the fact that all the colleges, which basically the government funds mostly, is actually giving away their content for free. Where is this going? How can colleges exist by providing all of what they do for free? So that's the biggest uh, uh, debate at the, at the moment. But I want to take you away from MOOCs just for a moment. I'll come back to MOOCs in a while. But I just want to talk about innovation. Innovation is a word that's been talked about here quite a bit. Now, what is innovation? Well, my definition of innovation, in some ways, it's a, it's a, it's, it's a little like invention. But it's looking at doing things a different way and doing things that are familiar to you and changing it. And it's not just in the physical things that's around you in terms of innovation and treating them differently. It's also changing what's inside your head. It's also looking at things that you used to know 
and, and changing them and accepting that there's ways, new ways of doing things. And being willing to change away from what we're used to is really, really important in accepting innovation. And in all of this room, we have a lot of leaders in this area. So actually, the onus is on us to be the first to be able to accept innovation and to look at new ways and better ways of doing things. So I, I want to um, just do a little bit of audience participation. And it's just a very, very simple thing. And I just want to just kind of proving a point. Could you all, anyone who has studied in college and who has graduated, could you just put up your hand, please? OK. For those of you who don't have your, just keep it up your hand for a moment. For those of you who don't have, a, uh, who have done a professional qualification, uh, put up your hand. OK, a few more hands. OK, down. Now another question for you. The last time you were applying for a job, how many of you put those certifications on the CV or resume? OK, great participation here. OK. For those of you that were, if you were applying for a job tomorrow, how many of you would put those certifications on the resume and CV? Hands again. OK. Final question. How many of you would like to sit the exam that you did a long time ago tomorrow morning and prove that you really know that stuff? <laughs> All right. Our participation rate has just fallen very, very dramatically. OK. The point I'm trying to prove is actually that the education system that we have is very, very imperfect. I, I could say much more aggressive things, but I thought that was a nice way of saying it. OK. But the thing is, there are two billion people on the web currently. There are five billion people that are not. Now, it's the work of a lot of us to actually get those people. And an awful lot of those people are young people. Are we really going to try and educate these people with the old ways of how we've dealt with education and training? It's a disaster. There's a couple of things that are really changing the education environment. The first thing is that there's an absolute tidal wave of education going on the web. People are creating courses all over the place on stuff that there was never courses on before. Great stuff. Great opportunity. But the fact is we cannot accredit these courses and this learning in the same way that we used to. We just don't have the resources. The other thing as well is it's, it's, it's phenomenally expensive. It's just, it just can't happen. And if we don't allow it to happen, then we're restricting learning. We're not letting learning free, which really we have to do. So, and just to the point I would just want to make, go back to the, to the fact that uh, we're all copying out on, on, our, on the exams that we did. What does the employer want? Well, the employer doesn't care where you did the exam. He doesn't care how long it, he, it took you to get it. He doesn't care, or she doesn't care, how much it, how much it cost you, how long it, it took you to get it, or where you got it from. They just want to know that when you turn up on Monday morning, that you know how to do the job. And this is particularly for young people, which is the focus of this conference. Um, because obviously, as you get on in career, it's other broader experience that's more important. But for young people, it's really important to be able to prove what you know. So what if I told you that there's a solution here? There is a solution to make all education and all testing free in the world. And it's available now. And the fact is that you're all very familiar with it. Because it drives the likes of Google, it drives the likes of fake Facebook, it makes the radio that you listen to in your car free, it makes the TV free. It's called the freemium model. It's advertising, but often advertising supported by the sales of premium services. That can be applied to learning. And I believe, I'm a firm believer, that advertising has to be applied to education. It's already in it. The only reason that people say that it can't be applied is a lot of snobbery. And the next thing is actually just status quo, which is the single biggest thing that we have to fear for in education, is that people don't want change. There's a lot of people in this world that education, the system that's there currently, really suits them. They like to get their $250,000 tenured position in a college. Or they're, they're you know, so think, there's a lot of people that don't want to change. So there's a dirty little secret that's going on online about the freemium model and about advertising. And the, there's two things to be said. One, education is sticky. For someone who understands consumer internet, that's great. People, when they're studying online, spend a long time online. It means that they're going to click a lot of ads. The second thing is a bit more subtle, but it is the real elephant in the room, is that I think you'll all agree with me that a lot of people, a lot more information on people is available today. Facebook knows more about you. Google knows more about you. The fact that companies all around the world know more and more about you means that they can present you with more accurate advertising. 
What that means to free education is that they can give you more free product and still make money out of you. That means that not only will you be able to get free learning, but you will get free aptitude tests, you'll get free human capital management. You can see a tidal wave of free services coming in education and training because people can make money out of the fact of doing it. So isn't it a phenomenal thought? All, particularly fact-based education, can be free on the web. And what about testing? Okay, last item of audience participation. Uh, how many of you have a smartphone? And if you have, could you just hold it up over your head? Or if you don't, just put up your hand and just say that you have one. Okay, you have in your hand one of the most powerful devices known to man. It is an amazing thing what you can do with it. But the, what's the amazing thing from my perspective is that this is a universal testing center. I can test anyone, anywhere, on anything under the sun on this. So you talk about rural youths, it does, they don't have to go to a capital city to actually do in a training center. If I really want to know if they know something, here, give them, give, give them a test. What you need is to have the tests so that you can line them up and quickly give people a test. But services like Allison are queuing these assessments all the time. So you can have free education and you can have free testing worldwide if you embrace the opportunity. So to, just to finish up, I'm going to make a few points more about MOOCs. And I'm just going to, a few more general comments about education. MOOCs, or for those that are familiar with it, a lot of people say completion rates are very poor. You have to compare apples with apples, not... Um, say, for instance, you're going shopping. There's a shop that charges $5 to get into, or there's a shop that you can walk in and you can look around. You might go into the one that charges $5, but you're really going to think about what you're going to buy when you get in there, right? If you can just walk into some place and walk out, you might freely do it. Same thing. If you can go on and do a course and have a look, five, five, five minutes or ten minutes, people are, you know, it's great that you can actually go in and check out a psychology course and see if you want to do it or not, and then decide, oh, this course isn't for me. That's great. If you want to try that out in university, you'll have to pay first. So the fact is the completion rates need to be looked in a different way. But there are some interesting facts. On Coursera, which in fairness gets more publicity than everyone else, they have an 11% uh, completion rate of starting courses. On Allison, it's 18%. Why? Because we provide self-paced learning, and self-paced is just a lot easier to, uh, to arrange your schedule to do self-paced. One exciting thing, statistic that I'm seeing out of the Allison stats that should excite everyone in the room that deals with development is women. More women are studying on MOOCs than anyone else. Why? Two things. Women have lots of responsibilities, men don't, and they, and they have to have more flexibility with their time. So when it's self-paced learning, that really suits them. The second thing, when we just look at, at the research, is that there are countries in the world where women are not as mobile as they might be. And, but getting online, they can get online. And if you can get online and study anything, anywhere, it's pretty cool. So I think that free learning is a real opportunity for development, particularly with women. And MOOCs are not just for people with degrees. Casera, Udacity, 75% of the people that are doing these courses already have a degree, right? That's only so exciting to people in this world, where we're in this room. But the fact is on Allison, and we have two million learners, less than 5% of degrees because they're, they're learning more basic skills. So MOOCs are just not, even though the, most of the people on MOOCs today are, are actually very highly educated, they don't need to be. Uh, then the, just a final word of warning, that a lot of MOOCs are not self-paced. You have to wait until the professor comes and that Obviously, it's not as flexible as it might be. A couple of points that I want to make to finish up. One very controversial thing I want to say. I think teachers need to be taken out of education. Okay? And the point is, they need to be taken out of education where they can be taken out. I was reading the other day just on the history of, of the motor car. And it's amazing that from 1900 to 1920, basically the, the horse was completely uh, taken over from by, by the motor car. A very, very short period of time. But I was reading the witness, eyewitness accounts as to why they changed. And I was listening to an account for a doctor. And back then, a doctor needed to have three horses because um, they, they needed a reliable uh, way of getting around. And I was listening to one person in particular, and, and he was saying that the benefit of the motor car was obedience. <laughs> and I thought that was remarkable. But really what he was saying is, is, in a technical term, it was animation. Where you can take the person or the human element or the, the live element of a teacher out of education and they don't need to be in it, that's great, because then it's scalable. So, yes, teachers are precious, and they will, they, you know, there will always be teachers, 
but in terms of fact-based learning, they need to be taken out as much as possible. Beware the status quo. So let me ask you a question, it's rhetorical, I don't want the answer. It's just, if somebody turns up in Kenya and they, they say to you that they're a network engineer, they haven't passed the Cisco exams, they haven't done the CCMA, but when you give them a test of online networking, they pass every test that you give them. So my question is, are they a network engineer? Well, yes, they are. Yes, they are. Do they have to pay the $3,000 to Cisco to be certified? No, they don't. So we need to start jettisoning this idea that certification and proving that somebody knows something, that you have to get the stamp from somebody who just charges a lot of money, you have to get that out of your head. We can test people a lot simpler and a lot more freely. Rural youth, a bit of my own advice, is that what do they need? They need to learn English. Sorry to people who think that that's uh, on a, you know, not the right thing to say, but most of the knowledge of the world and most of the skills training is in English. So if you can teach people English, it's really, really important. You need to teach them IT, but not just office skills. You need to sh show them analytics. And there's lots of free courses on analytics about websites because people, even if they're in the furthest parts of Africa, they can get online. They need to understand how websites work. And the, and the third thing is programming. It's easy enough. Basic HTML gives them great uh, capability. And then entrepreneurship. Those three, th three things are in abundance online for free. And the final thing I just want to remind you is that you really, really need to think differently. And there is genius in simplicity. Thank you. <laughs>